going through the timeline and see what uh, I missed last time and cover that and be done with it. And then I'm going to talk about class templates, um, which you're going to need it greatly for next semester. Okay, um, But before doing that, I'm going to go through uh, templated time, uh, typecasts. All right, uh, when we are casting in C++, let me just create the file that I want to create. So add new item. <clears throat> OK, um, include IO stream. Namespace STD. Casting in C++. What is casting in C++? Quickly, I'm going to go through it. Then we're going to go through templated cast. I call them templated casts, casts, but you'll see what I mean by templated cast. Um, when you when you have a class, any type of class, okay? When you have a class, any type of class. Let's say I have a class student. Okay, I don't care what's in the what's in the properties and what it does. I'm just interested in one thing, and it's in constructor. So I'm going to say the student has a constructor, and that constructor accepts, let's say, uh, an unsigned long integer that is the student number. How does it do deal with it? I don't care. I don't just that's all I'm interested in. Okay? Keep that in mind. Okay? Keep that in mind. So I have a class student, and that student has a constructor that accepts a student number and creates a student, uh, student out of it. What does it do with it? We don't care. All that's all we need. Now, keep that let that be, and let's talk about cast. What is casting? In C, you learn that casting is temporarily changing the type of one variable into another one. And we know that it happens automatically, which you really don't really care about. You comfortably wrote stuff like to drop a, the partial parts of a double, you had an int num, and then you have a double money. You wanted to drop the sense out of it, you said num is money, right? And then when the money was, like the value of money was something like this, what would go in num was 23. It would drop the 45, right? It literally casts it. So when, when you do something like this in C language, essentially, it means you are doing something like this. You are saying int money. So you're essentially saying, but compiler understands it. Compiler sees at left side you have an integer, at right side you have a double, so it applies that cast for you. Are we okay with this? That's how casts work in C language. Okay? In C++, they told you the cast is cast, but hey, instead of putting the braces over there, put it around the variable. The center changed, right? They said the syntax is changed. Instead of putting the braces around the type, put it around the thing you are casting. They never told you why. OK? Why? That student explains it. OK? That student explains it. How does it explain it? Make it what it does.
if for some reason I have a student object, let's say I'm going to put zero over here to put it in a safe, empty state, uh, uh, state, OK? So now, if I have a student, S, OK? And now if I do like this, what's going to happen? If I say S is set to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. What's going to happen here? Assignment operator will be called? No, there is no assignment operator. All I have is a constructor, correct? So what does happen? Compiler looks at the right side of the assignment operator, like the previous line with that int money thingy. It tries to cast that long integer into a student. How does it cast? Temporarily? Using the constructor. It checks the student. Hey, student, do you have a constructor that accepts a long integer? Yes, I do. Therefore, it does exactly what we did in line 10. Without you knowing, it does this. What does it do? It creates a temporary nameless student out of that number because it has the tool for it. The number gets upgraded, upcasted to a student. Now you have students on both sides of the, the equation. Now a shallow copy is going to happen if it's not set, or assignment operator is not set, or whatever. Or if it is set, the assignment operator, copy assignment operator will call, we don't care how. The student, nameless student at right side, will be put on the student on left side. And right at the end of semicolon, at line 13.5, between line 13 and 14, that nameless student will die. The destructor will be called. That is why I always scream at the top of my lungs, you cannot call a constructor. A call constructor is creating a temporary nameless object. You're not calling anything. You are creating it's not a function call. It's instantiation. You are creating an English student out of that double, and da, 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 da. Okay, and the rest is history. We know how it is. Yes, sir. Wait, 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 wait. I have only one microphone. It's good. I'm going to lose some weight. <laughs> Here you are. Uh, so in this case, what would be the value of S? The temporary content of student. So whatever that temp student is, and however you define the assignment operator, yeah, it's going to happen. Okay. All right? How was it? OK, beautiful. All right. Any other question? No question? All right, I'll put it over here for the virtual student. All right. So that's casting in C++, OK? And as you see, it's an extremely expensive thing, OK? It, when I say exp expensive thing, it, what does it mean? At line 13, you are creating an object, whole object. You are using that object for whatever you do, and then immediately afterwards, you're removing it out of memory. You know how much, how expensive that is? If you put that in a loop, it's going to take forever. And that's why some person who doesn't know how to program and the person who does know how to program, the person who's better in programming and runs hundreds of times faster than you because you just did it like that. You say, it works. And every single time that thing is getting executed, compiler has to ask for memory, create it, no, every single time. The person who's wise is going to say, I'm going to overload the assignment operator, get an integer, and set the thing so I don't have to create a temporary nameless object. They actually overload the assignment operator with a long integer and set the student the way it's supposed to be in the most efficient way. They take over that thing from the thing. Now, this is pretty wild. It's wild, wild west. Like this, you can do stuff that sometimes the results are unpredictable. You cast children to parents like this. So if essentially you have, uh, say, a class employee, and then you have a class professor inherited out of the class employee. You can have an instance of employee, and you can say employee, and then you put a professor in it. 
So because professor is child of employee, that cast is different. It only looks at the employee part of the student and copies that part. So it's crazy. So to make sure that the casts are happening properly and exactly what you want them to do, for example, what I just told you, you want to downcast a professor into an employee or you want to downcast a student to a customer because you're essentially customers, right? Or a person or an entity or an whatever, okay? An ID. So they want to downcast your, your class and only use part of your class because that is only needed. Because of this, they created templated casting, which essentially are templates to safely convert one thing to another. And these casts are, they are called static cast, reinterpret cast, const cast, and dynamic cast. Okay? How does it work? So essentially, if you want to cast, I'm just showing you the syntax, and I'm going to explain what each one means. So I have hours that is double, an integer that is minutes, and I want to convert that minutes into double. I'm saying static cast. In front of it, I put double. Then I'm going to put the type I want to be casted. This statically casts a double into an integer. And it will fail if these two are not related. So static cast are, is the most common thing that you use. Usually things are very similar and they are related. You want to cast something to another one. Okay, the two things that are related are similar. You want to just cast between the two. You do static cast. In that case, if you put two things over here that are not related, I'll show you, this is going to fail and throw an exception. So you know you did something wrong. Oh, you're going to have bad loss of data or reinterpreting data without you need knowing it. You don't need to, as you see, this is at the, at the end of the semester. Just understand what it does. When you come to 3, 4, 5, you'll actually use it. Okay? Yes, sir. Is it going to be on the final exam? Just the definition. I don't know. Where is that son here? He's not here because he wants a written document in this. No. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be. But if it is, I'm not going to give you a code for it. I'm going to tell you what, tell me what re, uh, static cast does. So you got to just, are you going to say performs limited type checking, uh, yada, 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 and that's it. So it's just a little thing about it. So you, if you just say static cast is to convert related types to each other, I'm done. Okay, you got the full mark. Yeah, that's essentially the definition of cast. What you just, she just said, are we forcing the change of data type between uh, an integer and a double? And I would say that's, the, that's the, the, the whole definition of cast, to force temporary change of data type from one thing to another. That's what casting is. Now, the reinterpret casts are casts between two entities that are not related, and for some reason you want to know it. You want to do it. I can't give you an example because it's way above your pay grade, okay? But, for example, if I want to convert an integer pointer to an integer, something like that. Some, I want to change two things, like an integer to an integer pointer. An integer is a value. A pointer is an address. Completely different ballgame. Right? If you want to do that, you have to tell to the compiler, the number you see, I want it to be an address. I know I was crazy. I didn't put a pointer at the beginning. It was an integer. Now I want it to be an address. If that's the case, then you use reinterpret cast, which means completely reinterpret what it, this, this thing does and convert it to what I want. Yes? Yes. This is going to be second byte in the, in, in the memory. Oh, yeah, I know. Whoa, exactly. Whoa, why do you need that? I don't know. But if you need it, you do it. This one, if you put related stuff, if you put an int and a double, it's going to fail. So this checks to make sure these two are absolutely different. If they are not, it's gonna, it, won't, it, it won't let you do it. Are you okay with it? All right?
C++ is made to shoot yourself in the foot. Okay? Which means you can do anything in it. Remember all those things that I told you? Create a method that is constant and return a constant value so that the property cannot change. Okay? You gotta say, the heck with it. The guy who designed it didn't know what he's doing. I want that thing changed. I don't want it to be a constant. Da -da -da -da. You can cast a constant value to non-constant using const cast. So if you have an integer pointer that is constant and you want no, not want to be constant, you can just do that. You can just remove the constant restriction out of it with this. Okay? Again, yes. Why? The person who designed the class originally was nuts, and he shouldn't have made that thing constant, and he did. And now you want to use that thing because all the other things are good, and I have no explanation for it. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> you, when you get to it, you'll see, okay? And then you have dynamic cast. With dynamic cast, you cast between hierarchy. You downcast and upcast. Okay? You downcast the professor into a, to an employee. If you want to do that, you use this one. So to go through the hierarchy of the thing, yes. Just know that it works. Okay? I don't don't even go there. I'm not gonna it just it, this is just it's just telling you that you can do it. So, see, read the opcast over here and you see what I mean. So you can look at the example. I don't want to go through it because it's OP345, okay? And opcasting is not going to be in final exam. Okay, so, so th th have this as your knowledge. You're going to use it heavily in 345, okay? These are, again, very, very sophisticated things that are done um, using... Uh, again, above pay grade type of program. You should keep that in mind. Uh, and now, uh, yes, sir? Give me a second, give me a second. Why do you have to always sit at the furthest thing so I have to walk for nine hours and bring this thing for you? Go ahead. Um, so, you know, when you created the object student S, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you initialize that object to like one, two, three, four, five, before like putting student in front of it. Which line you're talking about? Line 13. Line 13, there is no initialization happening. It's assignment. Are you talking about between S and a student, or you're talking about about before, between? Before you, you put student in front. Before. Oh yeah, so I put in line 11, I have a student that automatically is initialized to zero to put in a safe state, I yeah. guess. And that's, and yeah. Once you say S equals to one, two, three, four, five, six. S equals to student, one, two, three. Oh yes, one, no, two, three. without student. Without student, yeah. So this that, happens behind the scene. I should have, I should, I should have, I should have, I should have, thank you. I should have write, written this. So that means what you so, right now so I would say if you write S is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, this happens. Oh, okay. Or you can explicitly write that just to show off that I know what's going to happen. But if you write this, this happens. Or again, you can explicitly write it. Like this one, I can write num is set to money, or I can write num is equal to int money. Potatoes, potatoes, same thing. This just tells I know what's going on. OK? Are we OK? Yeah. All right. Are we OK? That's what, this was casting, right? Oh, my lady. Yeah, sorry. Make an effort at least. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So 
here in the material, it says for dyma dynamic cast that mm -hmm. it rejects conversions from a base class pointer to a derived class pointer if the object is monomorphic. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Yes. Too? Okay. Which one you're talking about? Oh yeah, that, which one? The upcast or downcast? I want to bring the example up. It's right there, let me just see. Am I seeing it right? This is what we talk. Uh, can you tell me if I go up and down? What? Well, it's not there, but it's not in here? Okay. Okay. So when you are using, he was asking me what happens if I, if I upcast something that the compiler doesn't know how to do it. What's going to happen? If I upcast... Uh, an employee to a professor. I have, I create a class. I create a class of type, I create a class of type employee, okay? Purely employee, all right? And then I create a reference of type employee that points to a professor. So the second one is a reference of an employee that actually holds a professor. The first one is an employee holding employee. The cast of first one upcast to a, a professor will fail because it's only by itself. It doesn't have anything else to cast it to. The second one will not fail because the compiler knows that this thing is actually pointing to the next level. It is castable. So if it is exist, if, if it does exist, it can, it won't fail. If it doesn't fail, then it will fail. Does that explain, hopefully? Okay. Yes. Yes, and then use it as an interface. Essentially, yeah, sure. That, I think that, that, that's, that's, one of the, that's the main reason we have an interface. So we can refer to stuff by their interface reference, let's call it, or point. I should tell to Chris to, <laughs> to match the two things. <laughs> Because I'm looking at this and I know what I'm teaching. My apologies on that. OK, I'm going to take a look at the paper printed on that one, too. But are we OK to this? Uh, are we OK down to here? Good question. Thank you. You have another question? Yes, madam. It's not something that, it's not something that you covered today, mm -hmm. but I was reading here and where it says explicit uh, uh, specialization. Mm -hmm. It's talking about like uh, converting chars. Just for to understand that part. Uh, this is where there's a question mark there. Where there's a question. Oh yeah, okay, so. Again, they removed it. Oh, okay. That's, that, that's the thing that I, when I was doing, of, I'll explain, okay. Um, it's not in here. That's why I didn't explain it. You write a template. You write a template. And in that template, you're going to say, um, okay, this is the type and do such and such with the type. Okay? And then you look at your template and you'll see my template doesn't work for, with character pointers. If they put character pointer, this is going to fail. How do I fix it? So what you do, you actually create a function that handles the character pointer and put template with empty brackets at the top, which means this template is the one you are calling if the character pointer of that template was called. So essentially, special cases of your template that that template cannot cover, you completely do its solution and you put it in an explicit uh, set up. Okay, again, that's three, four, five. Okay, so again, 
when your template is not designed, doesn't work with a specific type, and you want it to work, you write an explicit, expl uh, uh, explicit implementation for it, and you set it to be the template for that one, okay? I think I just pointed at it, but I never mentioned it, but. Any other beautiful question? Yes. It has to be beautiful, otherwise I won't ask. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What's up? So it's regarding the first example. Uh, if you want, you can put it on the screen. Uh, so we, we use static cast as error, but I did the same with uh, without that. Static cast for the first one, static cast for the first one will now oh, fail. It works perfectly. from uh, our material, from our notes. Oh, you want it from notes? Yeah. Uh, so we could use just hours equals minutes and then hours divided by 60, uh, the same result. But so I still don't understand why we use template custom. To make sure that, see, the examples are easy, okay? Mm -hmm. What I mean is that you know that's an integer, you know that's a couple, and you do it. Sometimes you're in a code that someone else wrote it, not someone else, 5,000 other people wrote it, okay? Mm -hmm. and you really don't know the relationship between the two types. You want to make sure that this cast only happens if they are related. If that's the case, you use static cast. Otherwise, it will fail. That's why we have this templated casts. For the, for the types that we do not, we are not familiar with the hierarchy of it, with what it does. And we, these are all, as it says over here, as it says over here, these are all constrained, constrained casts, which means, again, these are to save you, save you from you. This is when I say you, you got to make this this constant to make sure you're not changing it because later on if you do a, do a mistake, you won't remember it and the compiler will prevent you. That's what it is. I know you can do it. Most of the things that we do work with just regular cast that we did before or simple calculations that you mentioned. This is for when the things are getting too complicated and you don't want to have little bugs that you can fix later. You want the compiler to give you an error if such a thing happens. Again, when we get to its knowledge, you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. All these constrained casts are there to make sure we are writing safer codes. One of the things that, the reason, the reason that they are upgrading C++ like this, it's a, it was a beautiful language, and it is still, and it had all the things that it, it's doing now, it could do before, there was no problem. With it. The problem was that it was too open. You could make mistakes in it easily. You had to be a genius to write code with C++ with no memory leaks. You had to have a brain of a, I don't know, somebody with identic memory to know how everything happens. So they added this restraint, this constraint to it. So when you write the code, you write what you want. So later on, if somebody made a change or you yourself did something that overruled your initial design, it will give you a compiler and we won't let you pass through. Therefore, you're going to have a safer code. Mm -hmm. That's the reason. Yeah, maybe this example confused me because it's simple. It's, it's a, they, can, they couldn't actually over here give you a complicated example that it happens in real life because nobody would understand. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, the next semester it's going to get more clear. So if you just keep it clear, I'm going to come and get it. Any other question? By far, this is one of the most inquisitive classes that I have. Very happy about it. I thank you for that. Okay. Are we okay? Any other question? All right, let me save this with a new name, casting. CPP, save. I don't know if I saved the other one or I don't even. Yeah. All right, so. Over here, they talked about class templates. 
we talked about function templates and we mentioned exactly how it works. We said when you have a function template, how does it understand what to create out of your function call? It's by the signature of the function. Because C++ functions, they have signature. From the signature of the function, you can tell what you want. For this swap thingy that we have over here, if I say swap double double, it knows that it has to create swap with double references over there. If you have swap employee employee, then from the signature of the thing, oh, it has to create swap employee employee. If you have swap employee student, it knows that it cannot make anything out of it that's going to give you an error because those two types should have to be the same. So from the signature of the, cl the, of the class, uh, of the uh, function, it can actually generate the code for the template. Again, templates are what they are and what they're named after. Template. A template is something that you, a ruler type of a thing that you put and you create something out of it, right? You draw shapes and stuff. That's a template, essentially. So it's the same thing. It's pattern of, a, of an implementation of a logic that you want the compiler to follow if it's used in the code. If it's not used in the code, then the compiler will completely ignore that template and will not in any way generate or create any code for it. I guess you just answered my question, but uh, so the compiler would create the function when it's invoked. Yes, if it's not invoked, nothing is generated. Literally, code generated. And that's why you have to have the whole implementation of templates in header files. You cannot have it in CPP files because it must always be available for the compiler as a whole. If you put any piece of template in a CPP file, then that piece is not available for compiler when it's compiling another file. Therefore, you must have all the implementation of your code embedded into header file, not anywhere else. Now, when we when we have arrays in C in C language, the most the, the one of the most, one of the worst things that they, they say about C language is that when you actually create an array, you have to be careful. If I can type and if over here, it would be nice. Okay. So they, they say, they say, you have to be careful not to go out of the bounds of your array. And if you do, your program's going to crash, you're going to have segmentation fault, and yada, 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 right? So we can fix it using templates. How can we fix it? So what is an array, essentially? If I want to create an array, what is the syntax for it? If I want to create an array, I put the type, right? Then I put over here A, and I'm going to put the size, correct? That's how you create an array, integer A50, correct? That's what you do. You okay with that? No problem? Beautiful. So essentially, if I have a class, and in that class I'm going to call it safe array, okay, I can put that attribute over there and make it available to everyone. But just make sure that no one can exceed size of the array that is n. So they cannot go out of the element of the array. No matter what you do, you've got to stay in the elements. How can I enforce that? I'm going to change this to a template first. So I'm going to say this class is a template. And the type name over here is t, which means when they are creating the class, I'm going to mention later on how, for that t you put int, and it creates class safe array int, or you put employee, let's put it that way. It says employee A, and now we need a size, right? So that size is always integer, correct? That doesn't need to be templated. So it ju it's just the value that I have to provide. You can actually do that. I can actually say int n, OK? So this actually gives me a way to do it. So I, I actually say, when they create the class, 
safe array. If they give me the type and the, name and, and the size, I'll create it for them. But I'll do something smart. I'm going to overload the index operator. So that's something that I did not cover in the, in the template, in the overload class that I had at night, OK? So I'm doing it now. So if I overload the index operator, how do I overload it? I'm going to say operator index, OK? So that's the index operator. I'm overloading it. And I'm going to say this index operator obviously receives an index, right? That's what you put inside an operator. You say A3. That 3 is the index that's going to come in here. Are we OK with this? And in here, I'm going to say when you are done, when you are, when you are given that index, return A index. If I do something like this, and what do I return for this? I'm going to return its reference to make sure that it can act exactly like the element itself. So it's going to return A index. Down to this point, I did not improve anything. <laughs> now, if I actually have an array of doubles created and five of them, and then I go access index 7, it's going to return A7 and it's going to fail, right? I'm going to add one thing to make it safe, to make sure this will never crash. It will never crash. How, what do I do? I simply say, give me the index mod n. What does it mean? The modulus of index to the size. So if the size of the array is 5, if they put 0, it's going to be 0. If they put 1, it's going to be 1. 1 mod 5. 2, it's going to be 2. 3, 3. 4, 4. 5 mod 5 is 0. So it goes back to the beginning. 6 mod 5 is 1. 7 mod 5 is 2. 8 mod 5 is 3. 10 mod 5 back goes back to 0. So no matter what they do, they're going to loop through their own memory. So they're, gonna not, they're not going to ruin anybody else's memory. They're just going to shoot themselves in the foot over and over and over. Okay? So doing that, it's a safe array. Now, the problem is that I created this little thing of mine to create this safe array. How do I actually do it? With First of all, what I need to do over here is to uh, create a, 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 that template thing. So I need to include this. So I'm going to say include safe array dot age. OK, so I'm using it. And the next thing I need to do, I need to create an instance out of. So if I say safe array, then wait a minute, safe array i. How can I do this? Like a class doesn't have signature. When I, when I call a function, I'm going to say swap 2.3 and 5.6. The values are double, so they knows it's double. The variables are double, so it creates a double. In here, I don't have any signature. With classes, you have to inject your signature over there yourself. So what you do in here, I can say something like this. I can say, for example, int, and I'm going to say, uh, 10 of them. There you go. So what happens now, it creates a safe array of integers with size of 10. And it's going to name it i. Get used to this. C++ is heavily templated. So creating an array like this is very usual. I know the syntax that you had, it was like square bracket. You were happy about it. You're going to see things like this everywhere, especially when you're working with vectors, containers, sequences, all the algorithm that you work, you're all here. So essentially, instead of you doing the little thingy in C++ yourself or C yourself, you write a logic that does the exact same thing in a safe way, and you ask the compiler to recreate it for different types as you go. So now if I created this beautiful code of mine, if I actually write something like this, What's going to happen? So if I actually write, so it creates an integer, right? And this is a call to an operator overload. So when I say ix, it actually returns the reference of ax, correct? 
So now it starts from 0, goes up to 12. If it was a regular array, it would have crashed, correct? With this one, what's going to happen is this. So essentially, it's going to, let me just run it and then explain what's going on. I don't want to walk through it. It takes time. This is what happened. So you say 0, it sets it to 10. 1, so you see I printed this over here. Let me just, boom. Oh, wrong one. One more time. OK. <laughs> All right, I'll debug. I put a wrong thing in here. You're not going to see much with the debug. Let me explain first, then I'm going to debug. Can I explain first and then debug? Yeah, thank you. So first it's going to say i0, correct? So it's going to set i0 is set to 0 plus 10, correct? So it sets i0 to 10, correct? Then i1 becomes 11. And it keeps right down to here, correct? But when it comes to 10, what's going to happen? When it comes to 10, 10 mod 10 will be called, which means it's going to go back to 0, which means it overwrites that 10 to 20. It tells you that it's setting to 10, but it's actually setting to 0. And then it's setting to 11. The proof is that when I reprint the whole thing, you see the first two is actually overloaded with 20 and 21. You see that? Now let's walk through it. Sorry. OK. So if I actually walk through this three years later, so again, when it comes to see, as you see, it's going to call the operator. So it goes to the operator overload. Index is 0. And n is 10. So the value for this will be, because it's a template, you won't be able to show it to me, but it's going to be the value 0, right? So it sets that one and comes out and prints it out. Prints it out. What up? To do. Stop. All right. There you go. It prints it out and comes back up. OK, to show you what happens, I have to do this. In here, I have to do something like this. I have to say integer uh, size set to n. And I'm going to say size. So I can walk through it for you to see. I don't need to create this variable just to show you the contents I'm doing this, OK? All right? So, and I'm going to remove it. So let me stop this and run it again. So um, I'm going to run it. So essentially, it comes in first. I'm going to go second. I'm going to go a little further. 14, 4, 5, 6, 7. 8, I'm going to go through 9s, OK? So it goes in here. Index is 9. Size is 10. 9 mod 10 is 9, correct? It is 9. So it's going to return the reference of 9. And therefore, 9 is going to be set to x plus 10. That is 19. And it's going to print it out. Now, the next time I'm going in, the value of x is 10. Oh, I pressed. OK, it's gonna be, I'm going to go for 11, so we see. So we go in. Now index is 11. Size is 10. 11 mod size that is 10 becomes 1. So it goes back to the first one. And it keeps going like that. All right? And uh, it has no problem being at left side of the assignment operator because what is returning is a reference, which means it replaces. It becomes the new name for that. Uh, uh, value. But anyways, so that's a safe thing that we created. Now, we can make this actually better. Like this, the programmer will have a bug that will never know what the heck is going on about it. The programmer keeps running it and says everything's going crazy, and it doesn't know because it's very difficult to debug to see it's going back and it's overriding stuff, right? So it's a hidden logic that kills them. So we need to actually show them some garbage value so they know they are writing garbage over it. To do that, I'm going to change it. Ch 
change it to this. So I'm going to say in here I'm going to have, I'm going to create T, I'm going to call it garbage. So I'm going to create a variable called garbage. And then I'm, what I'm going to do over here, let me take this size n out because it's just nonsense. I'm going to put over here n. So in here, when I'm returning something, instead of returning the reference, I'm going to either return the garbage reference or the real reference depending on what is the index they are sending to me. So I'm going to create a pointer of type. And I'm going to call it return. That's what's going to get returned. OK? Then I'm going to put a condition over here to see if actually the value they are sending in is a proper value. So what I'm going to say is if i is less than 10 and i is greater than or equal to 0, it's a valid value. If it is a valid value, then what I'm going to say is ret is the address of a index. I don't need to mod it by, by anything. So if it is valid, I am putting the address of the valid thing into the OK? Otherwise, if that's not the case, I'm going to make ret to be the address of garbage. And I'm going to make sure that garbage have some nonsense value. What do I do? I'm going to say garbage multiply equal by garbage. Just something that is completely out of logic, OK? So the value is going to be completely garbage. They are setting it to something, but it's going to go bananas, right? And so what happens is that at the end, I have to return the reference of either garbage or the index, correct? How do I return a reference? I'm going to say ret return. If I say ret, that's the ad ret run, return. OK, return ret. But this is an address. I don't want the address. I want the reference. How do you make reference out of an address? Content of. There you go. Done. So this will be either reference of garbage or reference of the actual element, depending on the value. Now, if I run this beautiful code of mine, remember the other one was 1920 at the end, and it was, and um, the values were kind of uh, like go looping back into it. Now, if I actually run this, Control F5, three years later, I will get an error. What is that error? Oh, it, the other one is still running. Um, control F5, was that the one? What does it say? Uh, identifier not found? Which identifier not found? Index, index. My apologies. Control F5. There we go. Now when you look at it, it is setting the values. You see, it says you put actually 20, and it says 400. You put 20, it says 441. Then you come over here, it gives you garbage values. So you know you did something wrong. It's not going to crash the program. You're just going to have garbage in there. So now it's a safe array. You can actually use this for anything, array of employees, array of whatever you want. Create an array. You can safely use it. You know if your program goes wrong, your program goes wrong, and nothing else. It doesn't exceed its size. Are we OK with this? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? Yes. If you don't use as for, yeah, I mean, do nothing if uh, the index is invalid. What happens? If I don't put anything in here? Yeah. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I mean, do it, the logic is incomplete. What, what is invalid? Print invalid? No, you can't. No, no, I mean, if the index is. Yeah, so. Just when index is valid, do it. Then I'm doing the exact same thing that compiler is going to do. It means it's going to be a garbage address. So you're going to send someone else's address, and it's going to give segmentation fault, or you're going to ruin someone else's. The whole code was to prevent rogue addresses, prevent loose end addresses. 
in places that don't belong to us. We just wanted to prevent segmentation fault. If I remove the else part, then I'm going to get segment. It does it. If I remove the X else part, it's exactly what arrays of C language do, which means it gives you some garbage address to somewhere, and it's going to fail, and it's going to crash. So that's going to crash your code. This is not going to crash. You're going to just see the difference between having else and not else is that this program will run incorrectly. If you remove the else, the program will crash. You're going to have segmentation fault core dumped, and you have to go through your see, see, see how things happen. Next semester, you learn exceptions, and you learn how to actually throw exceptions in here. So in this else, you're going to say throw array out of bound exception. So it actually throws you an exception and tells you your array is out of bound. Not this semester. This semester, I'm putting garbage values. But it's impossible not to put else. The whole idea of writing this code was for me to give me a place to put an else. If I don't put it, the whole purpose is gone. OK? Are we OK? Are we OK? Yes. Would would uh, if if you go out of bounds of an array, is that stack overflow? No, that's that's stack overflow is a completely different okay. thing. We don't have to stack get into it. <coughs> stack overflow. If you that's for functions, then yes, um, you don't know what recursion is. So how can I explain what? Stack overflow is you, when you incite a function no with incorrect, with if you incite the function foo, mm -hmm. if you keep calling function foo, which means I call fardat, 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 after 55 million types of saying fardat and there is no fardat because I'm fardat, then I'm going to give you stack overflow because you call too many things. Yeah. But in recursion, go study mathematical induction. Uh, you in, need a base in, conditional. So go study that one. It's, it's a little bit of math over there. And then you'll find out. Yeah. Recursion is essentially, uh, forget about it, nothing. Yes. The purpose of this was to create an array so it doesn't crash the program. So if I do something like this, my, my program will not run correctly, but the environment is safe. When you, have, when you create 10 elements and you go to element 12, you are going out of your house and going to your neighbors. With this, you are just ruining your house. You're ruining your kitchen. You're destroying your house, your own house. You're not doing anything with outside. If I have an array and I get out, it means you're going out now. You're ruining your neighbor's garden. A function is to do. Can you create a function for a student, or you need to create a class for a student? Function is to do. What is your name? Pega and Pega talks. What's the difference? Talk is your action. I cannot create an action called Pega. I say, Pega happened. It's impossible. The guy is an entity. That's why I create the class. Array is an entity. It's not a function. I am creating a thing. OK, that we, we got to talk. OK? Yes? No, 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 we're not doing that. That's next semester. It just, it was just. We're just, that's, that's try and catch us, as, 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 as I called. Uh, 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 see, I completely lost my brain at this. Exception handling. That's when I say throw. OK, next semester, you're going to, instead of writing code, you're going to write a throw statement over there, which essentially uh, stops the execution with a message instead of shooting yourself in the foot and try to debug. So it essentially tells you what's going on, or you can catch it. And well, we'll talk about it later. Later next semester. <laughs> OK. OK, let's get out of here. I'm sorry I wrote this example. <laughs> I'm going to write a better one in two seconds. 
Uh, are we okay down to here? Except you? <laughs> All right. All right. So let's get five minutes break because the other one is lots of coding. I'm just going to bring up the codes and show you how it's, how it's done nicely to prepare you. The next one. So let me just see what do we have in here. If the other one is a good example of dynamic memory allocation and all those things. If you want to stay, you can stay and listen to it. Otherwise, bye-bye. You can go. Okay, so it could be your end of, the end of class for you, or you can actually stay and see how I make a smart array, an array that you don't need to have its size. It's going to change its own size automatically if you go over. So it's going to resize itself as it goes through. Okay, we're going to create that one, another template that is even better than this one. Yes, sir. Friday, uh, you, you have, do we have a lab nine? We have, uh, probably I'll help you with that one, do a review or whatever you want. Okay, okay. So probably you've got to be not like nine people in here in the class, but if you come, come. If you don't, whatever. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to pause this, then I'm going to say something. The recording over here. And resume recording over here. All right, so uh, when, when we talked about the template to creating a safe array, we actually passed the size over here to it. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to actually create an array anymore. I know an array is essentially a pointer of, of that type to series of things that's going to be in the memory, right? So I'm going to actually do this dynamically. So I will actually take over the creation of array for myself. So what I will do instead of having, instead of having garbage, marbage stuff, I'm just going to create a template, uh, um, a pointer called mdata. So that mdata of mine is actually going to point to an array. We know an array is essentially a pointer pointing to a bunch of things in memory, right? So I'm doing that. Then I'm going to keep track of what the size of the array is. Classic textbook dynamic memory allocation. All right? Then after that, I'm going to create a constructor for it. In that constructor, what I will do, let me just remove all these things. So in that constructor, I'm going to set the size to 0 by default, which means you create an array. Essentially, it has no size. It's 0, nothing in it, zilch, nothing. OK? And uh, pardon me? Yeah, you. You means unsigned. It's a literal value for unsigned, unsigned 0. OK, instead of writing 0, you write 0u. It means it's an unsigned. We, you learned that in IPC 144 at the beginning, I remember. Literal values. OK, now if you want to not put the definition of the, of the uh, methods inside the class and keep the class cleaner, you can put it outside. But because the scope of the class ends, you have to write another template. Uh, command over here and then write what you have. For example, this one, I am writing safe array. Okay, so that's safe array. And I'm saying unsigned in size, so unsigned in size. I am setting the m size to size. I initialize it. If m size is zero, I'm going to set m size to one, create one element, and create an array with one element only. So if they put zero over there, I'm going to put, I'm going to make it one. OK? Why is it giving me error over here? No idea. Otherwise. All right, what does it say over here? Too few arguments for class template safe array. Oh, yes, of course, because I'm going to remove the second one, too. I don't need this. Yeah. I'm not going to pass the size anymore because I have a constructor in this thing. So instead of putting squared brackets, I'm going to put parentheses. I'm going to say I want five integers. So I'm going to put five over there. So that's my constructor. So essentially, I'm saying if they give me zero, make it one. OK, easy. Then what I'm going to do is to create the exact same things that I like. like 
a copy constructor that you do. So I'm going to put a copy constructor. There we go. So exactly how a copy constructor works. But please note that when you are creating a class template, you have to carry the signature of the template to every single place that you are using the class name that is not either constructor or destructor. So the only places that you don't carry the signature of the template is the constructor or destructor. You see the safe array doesn't have a T. This safe array doesn't have a T. But when you are passing, you want to use it to pass a reference, you have to say T because you have to mention which type. I want a safe array of integer reference, safe array of employee reference. So the only place that you don't put, all the places you put the signature T after the class name, except the name that comes immediately after the type for the class, constructors and destructors, that's all. The rest, you have to put it. That's the rule. So how do I copy? I copy constructor. I allocate the exact same amount of memory that I want. I set the size the same. I do a loop, go from the beginning to the end, and set everything. Uh, if you see in here, I'm putting int a inside for loop. Why? Because I know I'm using only that, and there is nothing after. OK? Otherwise, it has to be outside. Remember that. Otherwise, it's not uh, portable. So copy constructor, classic copy constructor. Copy the, uh, allocate the exact same, same amount of space. Copy everything over. Done. OK. I want to have an assignment operator for this to make sure it's safe. So for assignment operator, the difference would be that the assignment operator actually returns a safe array. So as you see, this one's going to have a T. It's not a constructor name. And it receives one. It's not a constructor. So I put the tab for it. For it. It's the rule. And how do I implement it? I was a bad boy. I did not reuse my code. Reason is that I want to have lots of code over here for you to see. But it's essentially the same thing. You see that? So. In here, I can actually remove this and put it in a separate code so I can reuse my code. So what I can do in here, I can create over here void, copy, const, Save array T reference A. Is it A? Yeah. And paste. So this is essentially a copy that is happening. As you see, it's a private thing. OK? So what does the copy do? It does essentially this. Correct? Absolutely no difference. It's exactly the same. So now I can reuse. So in here, I'm going to say copy. A. And now in here, the difference is that first I delete and then I copy. Are we okay? Any problem? I just reuse my code. Okay? That's what I wanted to tell you in, the, in your assignments. When you have repeated code, put it in a private function and, and use it anywhere you want. As simple as that. So that's a private thing that I have, and it does like, works like that, and it works going to work properly and everything. So that's that. Now, after the assignment operator comes the, the size. Now. I have a function that tells me what is the size of the the class. I'm trying to find it. Where did I put it? Size, size, size. It's a very simple thing. Let me just do it. Can't find it. But anyways, so it's going to be integer unsigned. 
So essentially, I need something to tell me what is the size. So I'm going to have unsigned int size const, and it returns m size. So my array, unlike the arrays that you have, oh, not parentheses. Unlike the arrays of C language, can actually tell you what the size is. In C language, when you create an array, you don't know what the size is, right? You have to have it from your code. In here, you create this template, and you want to know what the size is. You simply say size. It tells you exactly what is the size of the array is currently. Not only that, I can actually resize the array. So what I can do is actually create a function like this, say void size, unsigned it new size, whatever that size is, I'm going to resize my array to that size. So I can resize my array anytime I want. How do I do that? This is how I do it. I'm not going to code it. I'm just going to explain how it's done. Go walk through. It's good for your health. OK? I have an unsigned integer. I'm going to say, if new size is 0, make it 1. We know that, right? We know that our, in our case, if we don't have anything, if the size is 0, I want to have one element and nothing in it. Then I'm going to say t. And so I create a temp temporary pointer, and I create to the size of new size. So if the size is 10, they want to make it 5, they can. If the size is 10, they want to make it 50, they can. It doesn't make any difference. It creates the ex an array with the size of new size. Then I start from 0, go up to m size and new size, whichever comes first. So I'm going to loop through and copy the information. If they want to shrink it, I'm just going to copy the, fir copy the first ones. If, I, if they don't want to shrink it, they want to expand it, I'm going to copy the whole thing, and they're going to have extra. So it says it has to go loop through the thing with the i, i being less than either size or new size, whichever comes first. And it keeps copying the stuff into temp. After everything is copied into temp, I have all the elements of the array, so I delete the old ones. Delete m data. The old one is gone. Now I'm going to say point the target, the, the address of the array to the temporary one I created. Ta-da! Now my array is actually pointing to the new size with all this stuff. Now I'm going to set the new size to M size, and I'm done. So it simply sets it to any size I want. What is that thing good for? This function that I have written? It's good for this. So when they actually try to, they actually try to uh, get the the thing, the, uh, the element of the array. <clears throat> so if they want to get the element of the array, I know this is the syntax, right? So they're going to say, give, give me the index, and I'm going to tell them, send the reference out, right? All I need to do over here is this. I can check to see if the index that they are sending to me if the index that they are sending to me is greater than or equal to m size, resize it. It makes it bigger. So if they go to 20 and it's bigger than m size, it resizes the, the array to that size. And then afterwards, comfortably, it's going to return the reference of the m data. So after it's resized, it's going to say return m data index. If it's lower than the size, no problem. It sends it. If they go over the size, it makes the array bigger. Breezy, easy. No problem. And of course, we know that the most important thing that we should have done immediately at the very first line that we have written over here was to make sure that it actually deletes the data and make sure that it's virtual. So delete it if there is nothing in there. OK? So when you're done, delete it. Now, this array of mine, as you see, I think everything's good with it. Do I need anything else? We'll find out. So I'm going to put it over here. I don't need that 10 anymore. I'm going to say 
integer i, and in here I'm going to put, say, 5. OK? So the size of the array is 5. I'm going up to 12. Who cares? OK? So now if I run this program, either it's going to crash or it's not going to, what does it do? Uh, syntax error, what does it say? Oh, TP. It's not TP, it's T. T. Control F5, one more time. Did it run? There you go. I have from 0 to 11, 0 to 11. The size was 5. It expanded it to 25, to 11, whatever it was. And I can actually see what the size is. So I'm going to say at the end, C out, and the size of the array is i dot size. Control the five. It's twelve. Da, 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 da. So it actually tells me what the size of the array is. It was five originally. So if I actually look at it over here. If I actually look at it over here, the size of the array is originally 5 when I started. But as soon as it hits 5, it keeps resizing and adding more and more and more as it goes, and it grows. I just wrote you the template that already exists in C language. It's called array in C++. You're going to learn this in 3, 4, 5 in containers. All these things written. There is, I can tell you with utmost confidence that there is no data structure out there. When I say data structure, I mean arrays, stacks, hash, whatever you want, anything. That, if you don't know these words, no problem. You're going to find out later. Any algorithm that you want to write, sort, anything that you want, there's a templated library for it. Standard templated library has it. OK? So that's why. When you go to 3, 4, 5, you move from creating algorithms to using them. OK? So you essentially need to learn how to use these things. And there are such awesome stuff that you can do over there. You've got to go, wow. So at 3, 4, 5, you go to next level of C++. OK? Something that kind of gives you goosebumps when you actually go through it and you'll see how it works. All right? It's this is, uh, and as you see, it's not an, it's not like, look at the number of lines of code that I've written over here. How many? Like 58 lines of code? I just created a temporary, uh, a template for any type of array, literally. I can create any array over here, array of employees, or whatever. It works for everything. As you can create, like, it doesn't do that any, that what an array cannot, it's, it's exactly the same. Just 50 lines of code. OK? So for something to go to the library, not necessarily it has to be something complicated. It's just something that is used a lot. And they, they don't want you to use your brain cells for that. You need that for another thing, right? So they give you the tools to do it. So take a look at the code. Go through the uh, dynamic memory allocation. See if you can uh, find some ways to make it better. And send it to me. For that, I made it better like this. Use it and see if you can work with it or whatever. So this is it. That's a better way of creating a class template for array, I believe. Any questions down to here? You want me to do a quick walkthrough over it? Anyone? No? Yeah? OK. So if you don't mind, um, I'm going to just make it smaller because I don't want to go 25. So I'm going to make this the size of the array 3. And I'm going to make go over here up to 5. And in here, I'm going to say x, yeah, less than 5 again. Or I'm going to, I can actually go over here. You see what happens if I go x less, x less than 6 or 7, OK? So I'm going to go up to 5 to 7, but I'm going to print 7 of them, OK? so. What happened would be this, so we'll start it. 
Put the one over here and that one. Ah. Oh. Okay. So it cre it creates the array. So it passes three to the size. So m size becomes three. Because it's three, it leaves it. It creates three integers and puts the address in m data. So m data is now holding the address of those three things. Of course, we're not going to be able to show it because it's a pointer. It doesn't know it's an array. We know it is. Then uh, it shows the size of the array by going to the uh, uh, constant function uh, method over there and return the size. And it actually shows it's three. Then it starts from the first one. So when it comes over here, it tries to access element number zero. It comes in here. Zero is less than three, so nothing is wrong with that. It simply sends index of m data zero. And that will be set to 10. Then it goes back up, and that's going to be exactly the same thing. One is less than three. Two is less than three. But three is not less than three. So it comes in when we go in here. Three is equal to three. So it goes to resize and adds one to the index, which means it becomes new size becomes four. So it is not zero. So it comes over here creates four integers, and copies three of them in there, one, two, and three, and it comes out because i is now three, and m size was three. Deletes the old data, points the data to the new data, and sets the size to the new size, so now it's four. Now that it's four, it comes back over here and gladly sends the index of the fourth element because it's just created, no problem and it will be set to uh, 13. And then it's going to go 4, another resize, and it comes out. So 0 to 4, they're all set to that one, and it starts print them, printing them one by one. There is nothing happening over here at index 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, because that's the size of the array. But when we go to the fifth one, we are out of the size of the array, so it resizes the array to the new one, and copies all the four elements to it, delete it, set it, set the address to the new one, set the size to five, comes out, and prints it. Of course, it's garbage. I just resized it, and I printed the element. Nothing's wrong. I just see that I exceeded the size that I wanted to, but I can go back and set it. So this is not some gar garbage memory somewhere. It is your memory because you asked for it by going over the index of the array. Therefore, it actually shows it, but it's garbage. So it's the same thing over here. It goes over here, 6, and the size of array is now 7. You have two extra ones with garbage in it that you never set it to anything. Now, you could say I want I could initialize the values, but then that makes the template complicated because you don't know what is the initial. If it's an employee, you cannot set an employee to zero. So I have to leave it as garbage when I resize it. I cannot say now set it to that because I really don't know what is a default value for it. Okay? That is that. Any questions? Yes, sir. Anything. It's an array. It doesn't matter. Anything. It's just an array. Are we okay with that? Okay. There is one more thing that you can, uh, nah, forget it. You can, like, you can do stuff to make this thing work like regular C. Like, if they say, hey, I want this to work like a, a, a real array. So I can actually extract this address, OK? So what you can do, you can always uh, overload the cast operator. You know that. So you can overload the cast operator and say uh, t pointer operator t pointer.
So overload the cast operator and return M data. You can always do that. So they can actually extract the real array out of it and work with it and then shoot themselves in the foot if they want to. Okay? So they can, if, if they want to pass the address to an array, they can do that. So you can always return that thing or to give them access to it. Or if you don't want to, then don't, don't, don't do this. this. This essentially says this. So in here, I can actually go uh, integer pointer um, uh, p. And in here, I can say p is set to uh, integer pointer i. This actually, so p actually becomes, um, becomes m data. You can actually access the raw data inside without going through the operator and uh, shoot yourself in the foot, as I said. But I didn't want to, we don't want to do that. So it's your choice, OK? That's it. Have yourself a beautiful day. We are talking about exam the next day, people. See you later. Thank you.